Hello, I'm Dr. Monica Embers. I'm an associate professor at Tulane University in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. And I'll be focusing this lecture on the diversity of Bartonellosis manifestations and challenges to treatment. I have nothing to disclose. So the objectives of this course are to describe the possible clinical presentations of Bartonellosis, to compare Bartonellosis to Lyme Borreliosis in terms of detection, persistence, and treatment, and to identify the research efforts needed to better diagnose and cure this disease. So what is Bartonella? So Bartonella are gram-negative bacteria that are about 2 microns in size, and we know that they cause an intraerythrocytic or a red blood cell infection, and they're the causative agents of varying diseases. The transmission of Bartonella occur typically via traumatic contact with infected animals or by blood-sucking arthropods. The latter most likely occurs through inoculation of the host skin lesions by contaminated insect feces. From the dermis, the infection spread to a still enigmatic primary infection niche, which likely includes the vascular endothelium. Within the mammalian reservoir host, the infection spreads further into the bloodstream where bacteria invade red blood cells and cause a long-lasting intraerythrocytic bacteremia as a hallmark of Bartonella infection. Bartonella have a facultative intracellular lifestyle. So apart from red blood cells in their reservoir hosts, Bartonella can colonize different host cells ranging from endothelial cells to monocytes, macrophage, and even dendritic cells. So there are three well-characterized diseases caused by Bartonella species. They are cat scratch disease, carrion's disease, and trench fever. In a typical medical school course, Bartonella hensley is taught in the following way. That cats are reservoirs of infection. It's always acquired by cat bites, scratches, or licks. There are virulence factors, but they're predominantly unknown. Cat scratch disease is a benign lymphadenopathy in immunocompetent people, and that skin, liver, and spleen lesions can be seen in immunocompromised people, such as those with HIV AIDS. So cat scratch disease is diagnosed by a suggestive history and physical findings. Bacillary angiomatosis and peliosis are diagnosed by physical findings in histopathology, and I'll describe those further later in the course. Small, slightly curved gram-negative rods are not easy to culture, but they can be isolated from blood or skin lesions. And diagnosis is often made by serology and physical findings. For the most part, cat scratch disease in immunocompetent hosts is not treated with antibiotics rather just supportive therapy. Bacillary angiomatosis and peliosis, however, are typically treated with erythromycin and doxycycline. So classic cat scratch disease is most commonly associated with Bartonella hensley. This is characterized by a slight fever, enlarged and painful lymph nodes that can appear and last for one to three weeks. And we know that transmission is through the cat scratch or bite of a cat and by fleas. However, there are atypical presentations of cat scratch disease. And this is seen in up to 25% of cases, which is significant. A cat scratch disease can also manifest as ocular involvement, like uveitis, encephalopathy, granulomatous hepatitis, hepatosplenic infection, culture-negative endocarditis, and osteomyelitis. The majority of cat scratch disease cases resolve spontaneously and do not require antibiotic treatment. But when these manifestations occur, the treatment varies, and some other antibiotics that may be used to treat this infection are Bactrim, Ciprofloxacin, 
or azithromycin and genomycin for the severely ill patient. Shown here is a transesophageal echocardiogram from a patient with bacterial culture negative endocarditis. And this is caused by Bartonella hensilae. And as you can see, in the left panel A, there's a bicuspid aortic valve, a left coronary leaflet, which is almost entirely replaced by a large vegetation indicated by the arrow. On the right, panel B, there's a gheme sustain of the patient in panel A showing extensive fibrosis cacobacilli on the aortic valve that were confirmed to be Bartonella hensilae. Here it's hard to make out the bacteria, but you can certainly see the fibrosis. Importantly, there are also neuropathic cat scratch disease presentations. Bartonella-associated cutaneous lesions were noted in people with neuropsychiatric symptoms, and these are acute onset neuropsychiatric syndromes. These patients who had these disorders with concurrent lesions, of the study cited here, 29 of 33 had positive serology, or PCR, for Bartonella. Also associated with cat scratch disease are hallucinations, muscle pains and spasms, severe headaches, anxiety, memory loss, cognitive dysfunction, PANS, or pediatric acute neuropsychiatric syndrome, seizures, partial paralysis, diminished tactile sensation, and depression, which have both been associated with another species called Bartonella cholerae, identified in humans. The second most commonly known disease caused by Bartonella species is Carrion's disease. This was discovered in the 1900s, and the causative agent is Bartonella bacilliformis. This is most prevalent in Peru and in the Andean mountains. Interestingly, in this disease, there are two distinct phases. The acute phase is characterized as having a headache, fever, muscle aches, and anemia, and this is known as Arroyo fever. The second phase, or the chronic phase, is known as Verruga peruana, which is red sores that appear on the skin and sores that can bleed. Transmission typically occurs through sand flies and fleas. And the third most common disease associated with Bartonella infection is trench fever. This was discovered in, during World War I, uh, around 1915, and the causative agent for trench fever is Bartonella quintana. Like Carrion's disease, symptoms include fever, headache, and rash. Uh, this also can include bone pain and a variety of other symptoms. This is currently emerging in the homeless populations throughout the world, and the transmission of Bartonella quintana is often through body lice. So you can see here uh, soldiers picking through their shirts to remove the lice. So, as mentioned previously, there can be some severe complications associated with Bartonella hensilae or other species infections uh, beyond cat scratch disease. So, immune compromised individuals can develop more severe manifestations like bacillary angiomatosis, and these are lesions in or under the skin, within the bone, and in other organs. Patients may also develop bacillary pileosis which are sores and lesions in the liver and spleen. Blood culture negative endocarditis is commonly seen with inflammation of one or more heart valves that can be life-threatening. And uveitis, of course, is redness, pain, and blurred vision. So in 2019, we published this review of the clinical manifestations of human bartonellosis, and we called it an underappreciated public health problem. Not only are uveitis and bacillary pileosis associated with bartonellosis, but also varied neuropathies, aneurysms, vasoproliferative and lymphatic tumors, vasculitis and thrombosis, and hemangioendothelioma, and even arthritis have been associated with Bartonella infection. Importantly, there aren't three species of 
Bartonella that are associated with human disease. Currently, we know of at least 20 different species of Bartonella, 16 of which have been isolated from diseased humans. Probably the most well-published authority on Bartonellosis is Dr. Ed Breitschwert. And this is a quote from him. How in the world can you hide an epidemic from epidemiologists, microbiologists, and clinicians? Perhaps it is not so difficult. Incidentally, there are three main things that need to happen in order for an epidemic to be hidden. The first is having a bacteria of an unknown genus that's difficult to culture of which Bartonella certainly is. The second is the pathogen is what we call a stealth pathogen, meaning that it invades tissues but it's very difficult to find and to regrow. And the third is ubiquity. And we know that Bartonella has a lot of different reservoir hosts and a lot of different vectors. So going back to Bartonella as a stealth pathogen. Part of being a stealth pathogen is the ability to invade immune responses and to evade immune responses. So Bartonella colonizes an unknown niche when it enters the bloodstream and seeds bacteria that infect and survive inside red blood cells. Host antibodies incidentally have no effect on intraerythrocytic bacteria, but they prevent new waves of erythrocytic parasitism. So the Bartonella are actually replicating within the red blood cells and seeding the bloodstream. So intracellular bacteria have been to proposed to affect dendritic cell maturation through an unknown mechanism and they have also been shown to inhibit cytokine production and T-cell proliferation by inducing the expression of interleukin-10, which is an immunosuppressive cytokine. A type 4 secretion system is essential for establishing persistent intraerythrocytic infection. With respect to ubiquity, uh, Bartonella utilizes a variety of reservoirs, both domestic and wild. We're most familiar with cats as reservoirs for Bartonella hensile, but dogs, rabbit, cows, horses, and sheep have also been known to harbor the bacteria. In the wild, coyotes, rats, bats, foxes, and even rhesus macaques are known to be natural hosts for Bartonella species. Bartonella also utilize a number of different vectors. We know that these bacteria are transmitted by sandflies, fleas, and lice, but it's suggested that they can also be transmitted by ticks, a wood louse spider, and this comes from a particular case report, from head lice, bed bugs, and other hematophagous arthropods. This table shows a compendium of human clinical cases, including diagnosis, treatment, and outcome. And what you can see from this table is that there are a variety of symptoms that have been associated with Bartonella infection a variety of different treatments, and also multiple outcomes. So patients have been known to relapse, to exhibit recurring symptoms, to require extended antibiotic use, and of course to resolve completely. However, what's typically taught in medical schools is that the infection is self-resolving. At this point, I'm going to switch to Borrelia burgdorferi, which is also a stealth pathogen and shares a lot of commonalities with Bartonella species. I've spent 18 years studying this agent in particular, and this is the causative agent of Lyme disease transmitted by Ixodes scapularis ticks, or the deer tick. These are spirochete bacteria that infect mammals and we now know that over 400,000 people a year in the U.S. are diagnosed with Lyme disease. On the right panel, you can see the relative size of the nymphal tick, which is responsible for transmitting over 90% of human infections. Lyme Borreliosis, or Lyme disease, typically occurs in three different phases. The first phase 
is the presentation of erythema migrans rash or bullseye rash. Importantly, this can present in varied ways, so it's not always recognized as a Lyme disease associated rash. And some people may not even have the rash or develop the rash. Also, in acute illness, nonspecific symptoms like headache, fatigue, and malaise, arthralgia, and myalgia can be present. In the second phase of disease, which is post-dissemination, patients can exhibit phasial palsy or Bell's palsy, cardiac manifestations such as heart block and pericarditis, and central nervous system manifestations, most commonly meningoencephalitis and cranial neuritis. And in the late chronic form in the U.S., about 10 to 15 percent of patients develop chronic arthritis. And in Europe, patients can develop acrodermatitis atrophicans, which is a more widespread rash, and patients also develop neuropathy and cognitive impairment. So we know that Borrelia burgdorferi persists in reservoir and incidental hosts. So rodents are what we call reservoir hosts for the infection, and they fail to clear the infection with Borrelia burgdorferi. Survival of the pathogen uh, through the enzootic cycle requires proliferation with minimal host immunity. So of course there are a lot of different ways in which Borrelia burgdorferi is known to evade and suppress host immune responses. Primates, both human and non-human, appear to harbor a low-level persistent infection. And we know that some of the immune evasion tactics that are utilized by the spirochetes contribute to persistence in these hosts as well. Borrelia burgdorferi spirochetes evade the host immune response in many different ways. And not only do they evade the host immune response, but they actively suppress the immune response. So in terms of immune evasion, we know that they engage in phase and antigenic variation where they express different combinations of lipoproteins that could be targets for the immune response. And we know that they can become physically secluded in immunoprivileged sites. And in terms of active immune suppression, we know there are many different mechanisms that they use to, to inhibit complement recognition. Uh, they also induce anti-inflammatory cytokines like IL-10. They can tolerate monocytes. And there's some evidence their lipoproteins can become sequestered in immune complexes and therefore non-recognizable by the host immune response. So there are a variety of important common characteristics between Bartonella and Borrelia burgdorferi. They're both zoonotic diseases. They both engage in antigenic variation, which allows them to evade and suppress the host immune responses. They both cause chronic disease. And they are both difficult to diagnose and treat. And they both cause systemic infections with multiple different manifestations, contributing to their diagnostic difficulty. Importantly, we've seen Bartonella as a tick co-infection. So shown here is a study of forestry workers, farmers, and a control group. This was a serological survey of 190 different individuals. Immunoglobulin G, ELISA, was used to examine the serum for exposure to Borrelia and Bartonella, Anaplasma, and Babesia. And shown here is that the most common co-infection was associated with Borrelia burgdorferi and Bartonella species. Importantly, occupational risk was also directly associated with co-infections. However, it's important to keep in mind that serological positivity does not indicate active infection, especially with respect to Bartonella. So shown here in this table are a number of different case reports of patients who have been co-infected with Borrelia and Bartonella. And I want to highlight that on the lowest panel with the 296 patients who were tested by a rheumatologist. In this study, 46% of patients were diagnosed with Lyme disease, roughly 20% with arthritis, 
roughly 20% with chronic fatigue, and the rest with fibromyalgia. Well, the important finding that came out of this study is that 62% of those patients had antibodies to one or more Bartonella species, and 41% had Bartonella bacteremia. So 41% were either infected or co-infected with Bartonella. Interestingly, there were three reported cases of individuals co-infected with Bartonella hensley and Borrelia burgdorferi in New Jersey in 2001. Ixodes scapularis ticks were obtained from one of the patient's households and tested positive for Henselae and Borrelia burgdorferi DNA using PCR. The patients all had neuroborreliosis and after treatment with antibiotics, their symptoms did not improve. However, once they were diagnosed as co-infected and placed on a more potent antibiotic regimen that would also clear the Bartonella infection, the symptoms improved. So there is no direct evidence that the patients described acquired the infection simultaneously. However, patients treated for Lyme disease should be considered for existing co-infections prior to antibiotic therapy. An initial discovery of co-infection could lead to an improved patient outcome. So in terms of research needs for Bartonella, we need a tractable experimental animal model. We need improved diagnostic tests. We need better drug treatments for chronic, both untreated or persistent infection. We need surveillance among human populations, which includes bacteremia and not just serology. We need to perform co-infection studies to determine if immune suppression affects the subsequent infection. We need to look at vector competence to determine what vectors are actually transmitting Bartonella. And we also need to look at the potential for direct transmission, as there is some evidence for this to occur. Currently, there are three main models for Bartonella infection, and they include the mouse, the cat, obviously, and the dog. As we'll see, studies in mice have given a variety of different results, and it's difficult to determine what model is actually the best. Cats are a good model for Bartonella bacteremia because they can become bacteremia for long periods of time. And it's a myth that cats don't develop disease from Bartonella because they certainly can. And dogs uh, can develop persistent infection in their tissues, but their bacteremia is short-lived. So in the past, a variety of different mouse models have been used to try to test Bartonella infection to develop a model. And this includes both immunocompetent and immunodeficient mice, and it includes six different species of Bartonella, including Henselae, Bacilliformis, Tamiae, Gramii, Birdlesii, and Elizabethae. And samples have been collected from blood, spleen, liver, skin, kidney, serum, brain, and urine. And the tests that have been performed include culture, PCR, nested PCR, and h and &E, or hematoxylin and eosin for pathology. There are a number of different inconsistencies with the current mouse models. For most models, the bacteremia is very short term. We don't know what the optimal infection dose is. It's varied from 10 CFUs to 10 to the 9 CFUs. We don't know whether it's better to use a heterologous or a homologous um, species and strain. For example, there are a number of different Bartonella strains that are isolated from rodents, and they may cause infection in rodents, but not bacteremia and pathology. And conversely, the human isolates don't seem to cause a persistent infection in rodents. Uh, the methods that have been used include conventional and nested PCR, culture-based enrichment methods. And again, both immune-competent and immune-compromised mice have been used. 
In terms of diagnostics, there are a number of different possibilities, including blood culture, PCR, immunofluorescent staining, and serology. Based on studies that have been conducted at NC State and Galaxy Diagnostics, blood culture is the most reliable for active infection, and we definitely need more sensitive detection methods for occult disease. So this shows what the researchers at Galaxy Diagnostics have done, and to my knowledge, they're the only company who does this, this extensive testing for Bartonella. And so the blood is cultured with an enrichment culture called BAP-GM, and therefore if the bacteria are present, they will grow and be more detectable by PCR. And then those BAC-GM cultures are utilized in a droplet digital-based PCR system. So in this system, the machine basically generates 20,000 different droplets with DNA from the test material and performs an amplification within each one of those droplets. And this improves both sensitivity and specificity. So I think it's important to note that to date there has been no single treatment that is known to be effective for all Bartonella-associated diseases. In this study, this review article is pointed out that antibiotics don't significantly affect the cure rate in patients with Bartonella lymphadenopathy. Bartonella bacteremia should be treated with genomycin and doxycycline. In combination, this is considered the best treatment regimen also for endocarditis. And Erythromycin is the first-line antibiotic therapy for the treatment of angioproliferative lesions. Rifampicin and streptomycin have also been used to treat Verruga peruana, but when a systematic review and a meta-analysis of treatment outcomes was performed, it was shown that for cat scratch disease, antibiotics did not significantly affect the cure rate or time to achieve cure. In chronic bacteremia, genomycin and doxycycline significantly increased the resolution rate, but the recommended treatment was not better than other regimens for infectious endocarditis and bacillary angiomatosis. So there's no one-size-fits-all for treating bartonellosis. Oftentimes the treatment depends on the type of disease and the manifestation. For example, trench fever is typically treated with genomycin and doxycycline, arroyo fever treated with chloramphenicol, and uh, endothelial presence in Verruga peruana is treated with rifampin. If there's an endothelial presence in the angioproliferative lesions, an erythromycin is selected. And again, for culture-negative endocarditis, genomycin and doxycycline is preferred. So there's a moderate amount of research focused on testing different drug regimens against Bartonella. And in this study, a number of different antibiotics were tested against Bartonella, both in the log phase and in the stationary phase. And it was found that a number of these drugs were found to be effective, including azithromycin and ciprofloxacin, azithromycin and methylene blue, rifampicin and ciprofloxacin, and rifampicin with methylene blue. So clearly the combinations were a lot more effective than the monotherapy. However, it's very important to consider that Bartonella does not grow extracellularly. In the host, Bartonella are inside cells. So we looked at the antibiotic susceptibility of Bartonella, both intracellularly and extracellularly. And what we found is that certain drugs like ceftriaxone, doxycycline, genomycin, azithromycin, were relatively effective in the cell-free system. However, when we tested them against Bartonella that was inside of infected cells, they were not effective at all. You can see the minimum bactericidal concentration was above 16 micrograms per mil. When we tested these drugs, azlocillin was actually the most potent. 
So we decided to combine azlocillin with the next most potent drug, azithromycin, and with a separate beta-lactam, ampicillin. And what we found was that when we combined the two drugs, we were able to see efficacy against intracellular infection, especially with the azithromycin and azlocillin combination. So it's extremely important to consider how the bacteria are presented in vivo in order to test the efficacy of candidate therapeutics. We also don't know how the pathogenesis and disease is affected by co-infection. We know that Borrelia burgdorferi can be immunosuppressive, and there have not been any animal studies to evaluate co-infection in terms of how it affects the immune response, the diagnostic test accuracy, the pathology, the persistence of each pathogen, and the treatment efficacy. Shown here on the right is an example where Borrelia and Babesia were used to co-infect mice. And interestingly, while parasitemia of the Babesia decreased, the inflammatory pathology associated with Borrelia infection was significantly increased in these mice. So we expect that we may see the same thing in a Bartonella and Borrelia co-infection. We still have a lot to learn about vector competence and transmission as well. We know that Bartonella DNA is found in a variety of tick species, and Bartonella is present in the majority of, of surveyed rodents. So these are the primary sources for tick feeding, and it's not surprising that a lot of ticks are taking up Bartonella. And we know that Bartonella can replicate in tick cell lines, but we have no evidence that they directly transmit, that the ticks directly transmit Bartonella to a, a susceptible host. Interestingly, we also know that bed bugs can harbor and excrete Bartonella. Are they a vector for Bartonella? Uh, we don't know yet. Neurological symptoms and Bartonella henselae positive PCR was found in a family following suspected bites from woodlouse hunter spiders. And there was no other arthropod that had bitten these individuals, and so it was suspected that the spider actually transmitted the Bartonella infection. And we also know that Bartonella can be detected in dog and cat saliva, and there has been some evidence for direct or bite transmission. So in summary, we've seen that multiple manifestations of Bartonellosis are possible, and Bartonella infections should be considered if any are present, especially when you see cutaneous lesions associated with neuropsychiatric disorders. We've seen that Bartonella is very similar to Lyme disease in that detection, persistence, and treatment are problematic for clinicians. And finally, we know that more research is sorely needed to better diagnose and cure this infection, which is geographically widespread and preventable in humans and animals. So what I hope I have left you with is that the newly discovered Bartonella species, the large number and ecologically diverse animal reservoir hosts, and the large spectrum of arthropod vectors that can transmit these bacteria among animals and humans are major causes for public health concern. Thank you.